Well, good morning. I want to get started with our first thing on the program, an update from the Mosaic project that's up in the Arctic. And if we have three scientists here with us today, Sally McFarland, Stephanie Arndt, and Melinda, sorry, Melinda Webster, already got her name wrong once. Um, but we also have two people joining us from the Polish Den um, in the ice pack. And I'm going to turn it over to Katie Weeman to introduce them. Thanks, Liza. Um, hi, I'm Katie Weeman. I'm from the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences. Um, and thanks for coming to a year on the ice, Mosaic at three months. Uh, Mosaic is the Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. Um, it's an international research expedition to study all aspects of the Arctic system, from the ice to the sea to the sky. Germany's Alfred Wegener Institute is leading the expedition with key support from the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, uh, which is a partnership of the University of Colorado Boulder and NOAA. It's a huge international collaboration, and uh, U.S. participation is primarily supported by the National Science Foundation, which is contributing roughly $24 million to the project, making it their largest Arctic research initiative to date. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy is also highly invested in the mission, funding nearly $10 million. Uh, Mosaic seeks to understand our changing Arctic, so we also want to point out that this aligns very well with the broad science goals um, and findings of NOAA's Arctic report card. Uh, that press conference will be today at 11. Um, and now to introduce our panelists, we'll start with those who are here with us um, via radio phone, um, satellite iridium phone from the Polar Stern. Uh, so we have Marcus Rex from the Alfred Wegener Institute. He's the uh, Mosaic Project and Expedition Lead. We have Matthew Shoup from Ceres and NOAA. He's the Mosaic Co-Lead. And then for our in-person panelists, we have Sally McFarlane from the U.S. Department of Energy, um, Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Climate Research Facility. Uh, she's the program manager for the ARM user facility. And then we have um, Stephanie Arndt from the Alfred Wegener Institute. Uh, she's a CI scientist who will be going on leg three of the expedition. And then we have Melinda Webster from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, she is a CI scientist going on leg five of the expedition. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over. I think, are we still connected? Um, Matthew and Marcus, can you hear me? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Oh, crap. Okay. Well, <laughs> stand by. Hello, I think we got disconnected. Are Matthew and Marcus still there? Hi, Katie. Everybody's still here. Katie? <laughs> the next All right. Thanks, Amy. Uh, so we just introduced the panelists. So if um, Marcus wants to start with his talk, we can start with that. Yeah, more, more than happy to do that. Greetings from Polarstern here in the Central Arctic, from the uh, vast emptiness around us of the sea ice and the darkness of the polar night. Uh, right now we are at uh, 87 degrees north, so uh, we are on course due north, 121 degrees east, and we are locked into the ice, and we are drifting with the natural drift of the ice. 
there are a pretty isolated outpost of mankind up here in the, at the northern end of our planet with the next human soul about 1,000 kilometers away, and we are working on the ice uh, every day at temperatures uh, which are often around minus 30 degrees Celsius and sometimes during fierce storms. Mosaic is the largest Arctic research expedition ever with one full year operation of our flagship, the Polar Stern, in the central Arctic. Uh, close to the North Pole, and during this year, Plastern is supported by our four partner icebreakers from Russia, China, and Sweden. And Mosaic is a truly international effort with key contributions from more than 70 scientific institutions from 19 nations. A total of about uh, 600 people will operate in the Central Arctic as part of the expedition in different phases, and the overall budget uh, of the expedition is some of 40 million euros. So why are we doing all this? The Arctic is uh, the epicenter of global warming. We are really in the center of action here. The warming rates are far above those uh, in any other part of the world. And we do not understand this Arctic climate system very well. It's the reason why our climate models have their largest uncertainties, and these uncertainties are actually huge for the Arctic. We have never been here with a modern ice breaker uh, in winter, and we lack the, even the most fundamental data from the complex climate processes that take place in winter in the Central Arctic. We have been here with ice breakers in summer, but uh, never really were able to cover the winter season. And we are going to... Oh, no. <laughs> Did we officially lose connection? Okay. So with, with this, I'll say that we do have pre-recorded um, audio of both Marcus and Matthew's um, talk here that we were going to play in case it didn't connect at all. So if you're interested in that, feel free to find me after, and um, I'm happy to email that to you. OK. Uh, sorry, um, Marcus, I think we lost just the last couple seconds of, of your talk. Um, do you want to say just the last few sentences that you were going to say? Yes, I just continue where I stopped, and uh, I was just about uh, to say that when we arrived here we, uh, a few months ago, uh, we came to the Arctic in uh, late September, we found that the ice was thin and eroded, uh, it was a result of the unusually warm summer up here in the Arctic this year, and nevertheless we found an ice flow that is suited as a basis for our large uh, research camp here on the ice, uh, which we have set up next to our vessel. The flow is not perfect. It is thin and keeps breaking as all the other flows here in the new Arctic. But it has a thicker and stronger core that provides some stability at least for us. And we constantly adapt our setup uh, to the deformations of the ice and to the new cracks and ridges that form on a near daily basis. Um, we have to interrupt our work uh, when curious polar bears pass by uh, as well, so uh, we cannot measure every day. But our comprehensive uh, measurement program is in full swing. We are collecting data to better understand the complex coupling between the atmosphere, the sea ice, the ocean, the ecosystem, and the biogeochemistry of the Central Arctic. 
And very persistently, we will keep this program up and running for the full year, no matter which obstacles the Arctic will uh, throw at us. Uh, it is our mission to provide a robust scientific basis for the important decisions our societies have to make to mitigate climate change. And uh, with that, I wish you a very successful conference over there in San Francisco. Thank you. Uh, Matthew? Okay, hi, this is uh, Matthew Shoup, uh, also coming from Polar Stern, uh, and very uh, happy to speak with you. Um, I want to say a few words about the, the science and the scientific design of this fantastic project, Mosaic. Um, you know, we've been on, on the ice today and, and every day so far here, um, and indeed it's the ice that's uh, really the centerpiece of our experimental design. Um, the ice is so important here as an integrator of energy, a substrate for biological activities, a dynamic material itself, and really one of the key aspects of the changing Arctic system. So we'll follow this chunk of ice, this region of ice, for a full year to understand all the processes it undergoes, the causes of its uh, changes, and the implications those have on the rest of the Arctic system. Our starting point is an interesting one with this really relatively thin and weak ice. Um, it's posing a challenge for us, of course, um, with all the dynamics uh, kind of happening right underneath our feet. Um, Really, this, you know, this operational challenge is also a huge uh, scientific opportunity for us to understand current Arctic conditions, that these are uh, Arctic conditions right now. And we have this multi-scale design to accomplish uh, our science objectives out here. First, sitting here on board the ship is a tremendous suite of instruments. It's really packed full of great science. You know, Ground-based remote sensors probing the atmosphere and clouds, laboratories for processing samples of water and ice, balloons flying up into the air, uh, and so much more, just really packed onto the ship. It's really amazing how much we have on board. Uh, nearby the ship, we have our ice camp with different cities. We have places called Met City and Ocean City, Remoting City, uh, and others, uh, where we make measurements that need to be away from the ship, that need to be away from the influences the ship might have on those measurements. So Met City, for example, uh, of course has a lot of meteorological measurements. So we're looking there uh, with towers and other sensors at precipitation and radiation and turbulence and a lot of other atmospheric processes, but we also have sensors there uh, from other teams from Mosaic. We have, you know, ocean turbulence measurements, ice mass balance measurements, snow depth arrays, gas flux measurements, and even a fish camera. So it's all these pieces working together to help us understand how the complex coupled Arctic system functions. Surrounding our drifting ice camp here, uh, out at, you know, scales of tens of kilometers around us is our distributed network. Uh, this was set up initially by our partner vessel, the Fedorov, uh, and we now harvest data from that uh, distributed network to understand the context for our measurements here on Polar Stern uh, and to really understand the spatial variability across this region, and that variability is so important for us to capture and ultimately represent in models. We've had some excitement, of course, keeping that network alive, with ice dynamics sometimes crushing some of the sensors, uh, polar bear visits knocking out some, some stations, um, but in the end, uh, the stations are alive. I think we're very functional. Uh, we have a really nice drifting constellation, and that will be in action for a full year. And that's a really important part of Mosaic. This full year will allow us to look at the processes as they play out in different seasons, to study the key interseasonal interactions and feedbacks. And so we've been here for about two months now, and we really look forward to the next 10 months to carry out this full annual cycle. All these factors coming together, the full year, the interdisciplinary nature of the project, the distributed measurements with sea ice as the focal point, these all collectively make Mosaic a really unique and distinctive opportunity to study the rapidly changing Arctic system. So here we are. We've set up tons of instruments on Polar Stern. We've built installations of ice, deployed many autonomous systems across a large domain, and we've joined forces across disciplines and across national boundaries to address pressing science questions that will help us better understand, model, and manage the changing Arctic and its impacts on the global system. So with that, I'll thank you for listening. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, I will turn it over to Sally. OK, thank you. So I'm Sally McFarlane. I'm the program manager for the ARM user facility at the US Department of Energy. Uh, Mosaic is a very exciting science expedition and a fantastic example of international collaboration for scientific research. While it's led by Germany's Alfred Wegener Institute, the campaign currently includes contributions from 20 countries. 
The U.S. is one of the largest contributors to Mosaic with significant support from the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, NOAA, and NASA. Mosaic was specifically called out as an example of international scientific co cooperation on Arctic research by the joint statement from the second Arctic Science Ministerial in 2018, which noted that participation in Mosaic and other activities associated with the years of polar prediction was expected to increase predictive ca capabilities for Arctic weather and climate and their connections with the global system. Uh, the Department of Energy is playing a critical role in the Mosaic campaign through our Atmospheric Radiation Measurement, or ARM, user facility, and um, support of two early career researchers who are studying Arctic aerosols. ARM is deploying over 50 instruments to characterize atmospheric structure, aerosol and cloud properties, and their interactions with the surface. Um, the deploy deployment of the ARM instrumentation was actually based on a science proposal by Matt Shoup, who we heard from earlier. And members of his science team will be on board the Polar Stern working with the ARM data as well as many of the other observations uh, throughout the cruise. The ARM instruments were installed on the Polar Stern by a crew of over 10 um, scientists and technicians and who participated in leg one of the campaign. And ARM will have three staff on board the Polar Stern throughout the cruise to maintain the instruments. They'll also be monitored by U.S. scientists remotely. The atmospheric uh, measurements taken by ARM and many of the other participants in Mosaic are expected to provide critical data about Arctic atmospheric processes and how the atmosphere and surface interact through the annual cycle in the deep Arctic. For example, little is known about um, some important questions such as the energy budget of the first year sea ice, the annual cycle of central Arctic aerosol concentrations, the spatial organization of cloud systems relative to the sea ice heterogeneity, and winter boundary layer evolution in the central Arctic. We expect that the observations from Mosaic will be used to evaluate and improve processes in weather and climate models. A key aspect of Mosaic that's already been mentioned is that scientists are not just observing one aspect of the Arctic system, but they're making observ observations of the atmosphere, ocean, and sea ice, and these data will all be used together to improve the accuracy of these coupled Arctic processes and models. Data from the campaign is already beginning to be available to the Mosaic science team. Due to the limited bandwidth available on the ship, we've seen a little bit of that today, uh, most of the um, data that ARM is collecting will actually come back to our data center via disk. And we actually received our first data back from the crew who participated in the installation in leg 1A, and they brought disks back with them on the Fedorov. More disks will be sent back every time there's a resupply of the Polar Stern. However, in order to be able to monitor um, the instruments and so that the broader science team can get a picture of what is happening during Mosaic, we create these quick looks or plots of our instrument data that can be sent back over the satellite link daily. So this figure shows an example from one of our LIDAR instruments. Um, the LIDAR basically sends a laser beam up into the atmosphere that scatters off cloud and aerosol particles in the atmosphere. And the amount of light scattered back and the characteristics of that light tells you about those particles. Um, so we're looking forward to much more data like this from Mosaic. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Arndt. I'm from the Alfred Wigner Institute in Bremerhaven, and I will be the, t uh, the team lead of the ICE team on Lake 3 during the Mosaic. Um, in addition to my yeah, responsibility as the team lead, um, I was yeah, part of the organizational team of the snow work on board Polar Stern during Mosaic, um, which means that snow will be a crucial or is a crucial element when talking about sea ice and the interaction between atmosphere, sea ice, and ocean. And therefore, we had therefore a big, big um, yeah, work topic um, on snow, um, also during Mosaic. And therefore, I want to yeah, put my short presentation here in the perspective of a, of a snowflake when looking onto Mosaic. So as part of the snow work, we were, of course, then also contributing to the overall um, planning uh, before Mosaic started, where we set up or where we had just in our minds an idea how should the, the flow look like with all the different cities um, that Matthew just mentioned beforehand. And we had this imagination on how this should look like, but of course in the end, uh, in the setup phase, um, starting um, in the beginning of October this year, um, when they reached their final um, Mosaic flow, they needed to adapt that plan to reality 
but also this adaptation was then, of course, still not the final, as the entire system around, around Polarsia is pretty dynamic, and therefore they have to adapt their science and their, their work on the flow more or less on a daily basis, and then in middle of November, they experienced a big storm where the flow broke apart, and a big part of the entire um, scientific stuff um, on the flow had to, kind of re had to be kind of reassembled, and everything is working still, and we are still happy to collect all the data, but that, that just shows that even though we did a lot of um, preparation and planning beforehand, we must be always that flexible to, yeah, to adapt ourselves to reality and to, to the um, weather conditions and sea ice conditions. And therefore also, um, going on board as a team lead um, of, the, of the ice team, it's really tough in terms of preparation because we can't um, prepare ourselves for anything except for all those dynamics and changes all the time. However, seeing um, myself as, um, yeah, as a researcher on snow, um, in this entire process, um, all over the, the period of mosaic, we want to study um, snow processes and properties in the um, Arctic sea ice climate system and how does snow um, changes over different parts of sea ice, on first sea ice, on multi-year ice, on those ridges, on those new formed leads, which they just experienced again and again and again in the, in the last couple of um, weeks and months. In addition, those um, surface properties and especially snow properties, we do not only want to study on this um, once, um, um, in, on one time, in, uh, on one point in time, but of course over the whole um, sea uh, over the over the whole drift of the sea ice and of mosaic, and therefore we really want to tackle the interannual variability in those uh, the annual uh, variability in those snow properties and processes, all over. This um, seasonal change in snow properties is not only important for sea ice, but, but it's really of big importance for energy fluxes uh, from the atmosphere to the oceans for the sea ice in combination with the biogeochemical fluxes and, and all that stuff. So therefore, we do really see snow as kind of the connecting element between all those um, interdisciplinary disciplines we see on board during mosaic and do therefore see here the big need and yeah, um, uh, on, uh, we do see the big need on studying those snow processes, and I'm really curious to see what is going to happen on leg three, especially when the sun will come back with our leg. Hello, uh, my name is Melinda Webster. I'm a sea ice geophysicist at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I'll be joining the Mosaic Expedition on Lake five, so that will be from June to August. And this period is the summer melt period, and it is the most rapid transformation of the sea ice cover of any point throughout the annual cycle. Um, it goes from this beautiful, cold, snow-covered environment that Steffi was talking about to something where things start melting, and these puddles of meltwater start forming on its surface. Uh, these are deep turquoise colors of um, meltwater pulled into the depressions of the sea ice surface. And although they're aesthetically beautiful, um, they're not as reflective as the surrounding sea ice. So they actually absorb more sunlight and warm up and actually melt the sea ice much more quickly. By the time that Lake Five, um, by the time that it's July on Lake Five, it's going to look more like that third image up there where you'll have very melted, degraded sea ice. It's in a highly advanced state of melt. And this is becoming a more and more common view when you go up to the Arctic, because the Arctic sea ice cover is becoming more seasonal. By the time that I leave the polar stern in mid-August, there is the possibility that the ice at the mosaic site could be completely melted. We really don't know. This is dependent on the weather conditions, how many storms occur, how much snowfall occurs, and also, what's the state of the sea ice cover and where has the polar stern drifted to, which in part will um, determine how much warm water the sea ice is, is, is exposed to. Now, the summer melt season is really exciting in terms of all these rapid changes. But what I'm interested in uh, for my project is looking at this in the, con in the context of what satellites see. So uh, the summer melt period is notoriously difficult for satellites to measure sea ice properties accurately. And what I'm going to use Mosaic data for is the ultimate blueprint for assessing how well satellites are doing in measuring sea ice properties. 
and finding pathways to improve those measurements. And the thing that I'm most excited about is seeing what new information we can get of the sea ice cover from satellites. So for example, NASA launched ISAT-2 last year. This is a laser altimetry mission to measure surface elevations and sea ice freeboard, which we can get sea ice sickness from. I wanna see if we can get new information about melt ponds in terms of their coverage and their depth, which has important implications for the ice albedo feedback. Okay, so June is still pretty far away. Uh, it's about six months away, and as Steffi alluded to, there's a lot of changes going on. And one thing that I'm a little concerned about is how much is the ice cover going to change between now and then? And what I wanna illustrate to you is an example from this expedition called Shiva that happened in the late 1990s. And what you're seeing is this square box. It's outlining sea ice. This is from satellites. And this is about a 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer area. And what you're gonna see is the ice motion over a six month period. So pretty much the same seasons, but between 1997 and 1998. And as you can see, the ice is incredibly dynamic. It's moving with the winds and the ocean currents. And I should note that this is old ice. It's much thicker. It's much more resilient than what we're seeing at Mosaic. Mosaic has exceptionally thin ice. It's seasonal. It's less extensive. And for these reasons, it's a lot easier to get pushed around by the winds and ocean currents. So it's much more dynamic. So yeah, at the end of six months, you can't recognize the square anymore. So to recap, what Mosaic is seeing is a sea ice cover that's incredibly thin and less extensive, in fact, ever than before, um, based on our satellite records and submarine records. And because it's thinner and more seasonal, it's more sensitive and more dynamic to these events, to these weather events, to atmospheric forcings and ocean forcings. And for this reason, we need to go out there and better understand how the atmosphere, the ocean, and the sea ice interact with one another not just for a snapshot in a given year, but for a full annual cycle. This will really revamp our baseline understanding of how the Arctic system works. And while gaining new knowledge is really important, this is actually quite critical for improving our predictive capability <laughs> in forecasting what will happen, or not just forecasting, but projecting what the future state of climate will be like, what its effects are on our weather, and also on our ecosystems and society itself. So we've had a lot of discussions on the ice being thinner or unusually thin from Marcus and from Matthew. So if you're interested in what the conditions were like leading up to Mosaic, I'd encourage you to stick around or at least come back at 11 o'clock for NOAA's Arctic report card release. This will have everything that you wanted to know about all the past conditions of sea ice this past year. I don't know what that is. <laughs> and what we're experiencing on Mosaic now. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, it sounds like we still have the polar stand on the line. Marcus and Matthew, are you still there? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, Katie, can you go call them back and we'll start opening questions for the panelists that we have here in California. Are there any questions from reporters in the room? Nobody? Sarah? Um, Sally you talked about the difficulty of getting data back from uh, the polar stern, but I'm wondering is there is there either based on sort of the observations that have been made so far and some of the data that has come back, is there anything that we can say that we've learned in the past three months that we didn't know before, or things that we're starting to, um, you know, m m m things that are starting to be revealed by having the ship up in the Arctic where it is. Um, is this on? Okay. Um, I think that most of the scientists have been so busy preparing for Mosaic and, and working with the instruments on board. Um, I haven't heard a lot yet about whether there's anything that they've seen from the atmospheric data that's new or unexpected. I know the sea ice conditions have been, have been quite challenging, but I haven't heard yet about whether the atmospheric data is what they expect or not. Well, um, yeah, so as was already mentioned, so it's of course pretty tough to get all the data back and the people are really busy with just maintaining the camp and setting up all the stuff again after all those major storms. 
storms. However, I mean, also this is already one, um, exa or one um, result in the end, of course, that really the entire system is pretty dynamic. And um, this is something really, I think this will be kind of the key element in the end for Mosaic to, to get used to that di really dynamic system, which is new for us. And yeah, to, to work in that environment. More questions from the room? Okay, we, we have the ship back on the line if people would like to ask questions from our scientists on the polar ship. Uh, hello, Paula Stern. It's Jonathan Amos from uh, BBC News uh, here. I mean, it kind of st sounds that the, the message you have for us really is the difficulty you've, you've had in setting up the camp. That, that's kind of the message, isn't it? it? Conditions now are not what they were 10 years ago, and, and you prove that. That, that is correct. Uh, that was uh, one of the uh, biggest challenges uh, we faced here when we came that the ice uh, was so thin uh, that it was hard to find uh, an ice flow which uh, provides the stability that we need for setting up a research camp for a full year and for moving a vessel, a massive uh, research vessel to that flow. But uh, after some time, uh, we have been able to find an ice flow, uh, an ice flow which in large part uh, reflects the uh, standard ice conditions of the modern Arctic, which is uh, in large part in and uh, has been eroded during summer as all the other flows, but which has a more stable core, which uh, serves as a basis for our logistical setup. And from there, we now spread out to the thinner parts of the ice so that we can uh, do our research on the uh, ice that is characteristic for the region, while at the same time have a more stable hub for our operation. More questions? Hello, Polistan. This is uh, Christoph Seidler from the Spiegel. Um, Marcus, I have a question. You, you told us about the uh, well dynamic starting phase. Uh, how about the, the, the next month, the, the, the winter time? Is that uh, a time with the, the lower temperatures, but still where you can expect a little bit more stability and uh, are not busy only rearranging the, the camps on the ice floor, but uh, actually uh, get even more work done? Um, actually, the dynamics of the ice uh, continues. Uh, just, uh, I think it was about 10 days ago, uh, a major fracture zone formed right to the middle of our research camp. One half of the research camp uh, drifted sideways by 500 meters. All the power lines uh, were ripped uh, and destroyed during that event. All our um, tracks and roads have been destroyed. Um, but within days, we just reconnected everything and uh, we constructed new tracks and roads and uh, the things uh, were up and running just a few days later. And uh, we have done that uh, a number of times now. We just constantly adapt to the changing ice environment here and we will continue to do so. It is hard to predict what is going to happen now during the rest of the winter. The ice is going to get thicker, but uh, I think some significant ice dynamics uh, we have to expect uh, for the whole year. We have more questions from the room. Do we have any questions on the chat? Oh, sorry, we have Sarah Kaplan. Um, Marcus and Matthew, can you talk a little bit about that storm that happened in November? Um, sort of what were the conditions like? What did the team do during the storm where you sort of hunkered down on the ship? Um, how long did it last? Uh, just sort of paint a picture for readers about what that experience was like. Well, the storm was actually pretty fantastic, and it's something that, you know, we knew would happen, and it, it was a tremendous opportunity for us to understand something that's really important here uh, in the Arctic system. Um, you know, that storm made a lot of ice dynamics happen, and that made it challenging for some of our observations on the ground, as Marcus described earlier. And so there were some uh, interruptions in some of our measurements, but fortunately we have a lot of measurements that are ongoing, a lot of measurements on the ship. We have routine radio thons remote sensors looking up in the atmosphere. So we, we did a tremendous job of capturing the storm, capturing uh, the kind of effect that it had on the atmospheric structure, on the precipitation, looking 
how it affected the energy budget of sea ice, I mean, going all the way down through the ice and into the ocean and causing ocean mixing. And so it's really, I think, a, a great example of uh, what Mosaic is all about, looking at the effect of these kind of big events um, in the couple system on all parts of the system and how they interact with each other. I actually think that uh, for the first time we have been able to study the impact of such a system, of such a storm that, uh, that is commonly in Arctic, on the foot coupled uh, Arctic climate system between the atmosphere, ocean, and, and sea ice. So it has been a unique opportunity, and we have uh, used it well. Uh, I think we have a fantastic data set. I think it's probably pretty unique that you guys would say it was an amazing opportunity <laughs> and not like. It was kind of scary, <laughs> or um, you know, the, the a lot of people. The idea of being out on the sea ice in the middle of a storm like that would be intimidating. Um, was there any aspect of it that was? I mean, just can you sort of help people understand the size of it, or the the speed of the winds, how long it lasted? Actually, it was uh, it was a pretty significant storm event. It lasted for a couple of days, and uh, of course, it was scary. Uh, many uh, cracks in the ice formed. We had to go out in the middle of the storm to rescue some of our equipment. Uh, some of the equipment actually out of the water, um, and and that is uh, sometimes not nice to, to work out there in the in the storm at at very low temperatures. Uh, but uh, at all times, it was on our mind. Wow, this is a fantastic opportunity. We are we are. Uh, is the first team. Uh, we have been the first team who has the chance to observe the impact on such a storm system throughout the system with such a comprehensive set of measurements. And uh, I think so. It's both. We were all excited about it, and of course, it was scary. Yeah, I would emphasize that as well. Just to, uh, really, there was a lot of smiles on people's faces, um, a lot of excitement, uh, especially with the dynamics in the ice. Right? It, it really created these amazing open areas, these leads that came through, and then ridges, and it's just a pretty exciting place to work because every day your commute out here, fishing out on the ice is different, and I think that that was exciting for people. It was kind of that, that kind of new frontier exploration kind of feel that people, um, I, I think, really uh, kind of resonated with, and, and it kind of made them excited. Uh, Harvey Leifert, freelance writer. I'm interested in the polar bears. Uh, we were looking at an image uh, of two polar bears uh, at uh, one of your flags, and it looked as if they had actually erected the flag. But uh, I don't suppose there's a lot of data on the normal number of polar bears that far north, and I was surprised that there are any because they would have an awfully long walk or swim as the ice begins to break up. So do you have any kind of data about that, or are people surprised to see the bears that far up? Actually, it is not very well known how many polar bears live in the central Arctic in the middle of the polar night uh, here on the ice. There are individual bears which attract the GPS systems, and people know that they wander through the central Arctic even in winter, uh, but uh, there aren't any statistics. Our own statistics show there are many. Uh, we have so many polar bear visits. Uh, we have to stay extremely alert that we avoid uh, confrontations and approaches of bears uh, to humans. So uh, once we see a bear somewhere, um, we uh, immediately go back to the vessel uh, so that uh, we don't get into uh, the uh, into close contact with the bear, which could be dangerous for both sides, and, and we do everything to avoid that. We have a Data system to detect polar bear approaches, starting with uh, thermal infrared uh, camera system and uh, night vision equipment uh, to be able to detect uh, if a polar bear is in the area. Do we have more questions from reporters in the room? Questions from the chat? No? All right. Well, we'd like to thank our panelists and our scientists on the Polar Stern for joining us today. Um, and we'll resume at 9 o'clock for the next press conference.